Um, thanks everyone very much for joining. Welcome to Awake, Aware, Arise and joining us today for Total Brain Coaching. Um, just uh, before I turn uh, over to Ted, just want to thank everyone for being here, for joining us in this conversation, kind of showing up for the world and doing everything that we can individually to make a difference. It's wonderful to see everyone here and see where everyone is coming here from. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to go over to you, Ted. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I I'm thanking you because it's such a joy for me to be here with my dad, with such a wonderful group of people, seeing the chat kind of blowing up in the beginning and all the different places that are represented in all these people, all of you who want to help others uh, to achieve their, their full potential. And so I kind of feel like I'm, I'm deeply with kindred spirits. I'm with my tribe. Um, so I'm, I'm super happy to be here and super happy to be here with my father. Today we get the joy of talking about uh, total brain coaching, which is I, I've been doing um, coaching for the last 10, 12 years. I've been doing agile coaching, which is working with a lot of developers and trying to help them change their habits. And I was having a lot of problems. It wasn't as easy as, as we were thinking. And so I was able to, my dad has been working in the field of neuroscience for a long time. And so I was able to connect with him and we were able to come up from a neurophysiology um, and from the neuroscience angles, how we can help people be the people they really wanna be. So it's a great joy to be here with you all. And just so we'll, we'll start out with the agenda. If in the chat, if you want to type in your introductions, which many of you have done already, um, you could add an unusual habit if you want to, just to kind of along the theme of this talk. Um, we're going to talk about what is total brain coaching, and we're also going to have some questions and answers. So that's kind of how we're going to go through the next uh, bit of time together. And I'm going to first introduce myself. I've done that a little bit, but I'm also going to introduce my dad, who has been really um, one of the sort of leading and founding scientists in the field of meditation. He's written a book called The Neurophysiology of Enlightenment. So he's put a huge amount of time his whole life on what is this experience of transcending and how can it benefit uh, humankind? And it turns out that meditation, transcending these things that he spent so many years of his life studying and looking at has huge effect in helping people um, become the people that they want to be. He's written a number of other books too, uh, Gut Crisis, uh, The Rest and Repair Diet. These are around the gut-brain axis that we're going to talk about in this talk. Uh, and also uh, Total Brain Coaching. We co-created that book together and Coherence Code, along with my stepmother, Samantha Wallace. She was our editor, so big shout out to her. Um, my dad's also been president of Mershey International University and many other organizations. Uh, he's led many, many different uh, speaking engagements, and it's just a real honor to be with him and, and a joy um, to be able to work on this with him all the time. And I'll just, I'll, the format of this is I'm going to do a little bit in the beginning. And as we get into the presentation, I'll ask my dad to come in and we'll go back and forth a little bit. So why did we create Total Brain Coaching? Again, that's kind of my first story where I was in this field doing agile coaching, which is working with software development teams. And I was trying to get them to move from one mindset to another mindset. And it was really hard because these people are usually very successful. They're very smart, and especially in their field. And they've been doing something for 20, 30 years. And then you come in and you say, the world's changing. There's more complexity in the world. We need to figure out how to deliver things faster so we can get feedback faster. But a lot of times they just look at you and say, sure, yeah, OK. But then they just go back to doing exactly what they're doing. Um, so I was. I also have some background in neuroscience, and I thought, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with nervous systems, we're dealing with, with brains and, and hearts and hands, you know, these three things and, and souls and all this. And how can we 
get some shortcuts or we can, how can we help people be kind of uh, master of their own domain and, and help them change their habits and habits and behaviors and, the, and through habits and behaviors also how can they change their mindsets and we'll talk a little bit about what are habits we'll also talk about how do we change habits and then we'll go into what total brain coaching is so I look at habits as really um, pathways in the brain if I can't really see this. I have a glass of water. One of the habits I'm working on is to drink more water. Um, and an unusual habit, just by the way, uh, that I have is usually before these presentations, I can't really eat. And I always take a shower and brush my teeth, even if we're doing this uh, virtually and you're not seeing all of that, you know, or not having to. Um, so it, it's just one of those things that I always do. One of the habits that I'm working on right now is drinking a little bit more water. And basically when I grab this glass of water, you would have seen in my prefrontal cortex, something lighting up if you could see kind of my brain and it would have given a signal, would have gone through the brain as we see here and gotten down to the brain stem, which would have allowed my arm to grab this glass of water. And when we repeat that time and time again, it creates highways in the brain. And if we look at this picture, you know, there's kind of a main highway in the middle and there's this little road on this off to the right. And that main highway is like a habit that you've done many, many times. Like I like to make my bed in the morning. So that's probably a highway in my brain. And if I try not to do that in the morning, I'll think about it a few times, just even sort of absently, oh, I needed to make my bed. I might even figure out how to get back home to make that bed, just because that's something I've done all the time. If I wanted to change that habit, and we'll talk about this later in terms of how we change habits, um, I'd probably have to start thinking about creating a new habit. And that would be like that little road on the side. And I'd start having to reinforce that. But as I said, we'll get into that more as we go along. The main thing is, is just to understand these habits are pathways in the brain. And habits take time to build. So that if I wanted to build a habit of drinking water in the morning when I when I wake up, when I'm just like reaching for a glass of water, um, it probably take me about 20 days before that is just automatic. So obviously, I'd, I'd be good to put the water there right next to my bed. But if I just wanted to have it as sort of automatic, where I wake up and instantly grab it probably take me about 20 days. And this is what um, scientists in London have kind of figured out. If the habit is more complicated, um, like doing um, 50 sit-ups, it could take me 80 days to build that habit. There's a lot more to it. If I wanted to do a certain amount of sit-ups, 50 sit-ups every day, to build that habit, it could take me much longer. The more complicated that things people want to do, the longer it takes. So when we're dealing with computer programmers, which is the coaching I do, um, some of these things are very complex and it can take a long time to get them to change their habits. The great kind of boon that we have is neuroplasticity. And I'm going to turn this over to my dad right now to talk about and uh, further enlighten us on this. The great thing about our brain is that it's so dynamic. Literally, every experience we have changes the brain. So we're listening to this lecture, new connections, maybe even a few molecules are changed in some nerve membrane. We do something a little more elaborate and we start to change whole pathways. So this is a wonderful thing about our brain that even at an older age, it's very, very dynamic. And of course, when we're young, these pathways have a huge influence on our behavior throughout our whole life. So as Ted was showing there, these highways in the brain really have a large impact on how we behave. So if we want to make a change in our life, we literally have to rewire the brain. And the brain can rewire itself. It's not as if this is an impossible task. We do it all the time. But the bigger the habit we want to change, the more energy we need to do it. And that's really what Total Brain Coaching is about. It's about how to get the energy you need to be able to change a habit, how to discover more about yourself, what it takes to change a habit, 
and using some beautiful ancient knowledge to enable that transition. Next slide, Ted. What do we have for the next slide? Yes, good. So this is just reinforcing what I was saying here. Every experience we have changes the neural pathways and these change habits. Next slide. So the big problem today is that we're addicted to stress. We live in a world which is changing. COVID has just increased this whole experience even more. Um, we just don't know what to expect at any given time. And in many different businesses, we find that people are put in a situation where their brains are threatened. It's, they don't have the psychological safety they need to be able to be creative and dynamic. They have to get this done by this time, they have to this parameter, this and so forth. And this kind of old style of management, this kind of threatening style, really does shut down the creative qualities of the brain. And the more we're stressed, we produce um, cortisol stress hormone over long periods of time that does damage to other areas of the brain like the hippocampus, which regulates emotions and memory. So stress is not a good thing, and yet many, many people are addicted to it, and their management style is based on stress. So one of the key factors in this is to create a situation where there's no stress. Next slide. So why is stress so difficult? The problem is, is that when you have an experience, it goes to this tiny area of the brain called the amygdala. And that amygdala will interpret that experience. And this is where all your greatest fears and phobias are stored. So if your brain thinks it's seen a snake, even though it may be a string, it's going to set off a whole avalanche of changes. First of all, that information never gets up to the prefrontal cortex where you might interpret and say, oh, it's just really a string. Never gets there. Now you're on the rampage from running away from the snake. And you start to alert all the different um, powerful streams down, down below the amygdala whether it's the hypothalamus or whether it's any of the adrenal glands, any of the stress circuits, and you create this whole whirlpool in the body and brain. Next slide. So our kind of approach to this is to find a way to help people, and it's really coaching, help people use other parts of their brain and create new circuits in their brain, super circuits in their brain, which will allow them to be able to change their habits earlier. So we wrote two books on this. One is called The Coherence Code. Uh, it's really a business fable, a fun story of a business that's about to crash and how um, it begins to use total brain coaching and all the things that happen in it. And then the second book, Total Brain Coaching, is really the manual of how to do it. And you can look at the website, totalbraincoaching.com. A lot of the information we're talking about will be available there. Go ahead, Ted. So the, we, in Total Brain Coaching, we have seven principles. And they have the acronym Dharmic. And many of you may be familiar, Dharma is that path of life. So that, that worked out very nicely. Um, so I'll go through them quick, or I'll, I'll state them each, and we'll go into them a little bit more in depth. D is discover your energy state. H is harnessing your neuroplasticity and your gut-brain axis. A is the power of attention. R is rhythm and resonance. M is matrix, it's a feedback matrix. I is improve and integrate. And C is celebration. And each of these are principles. And within each of these principles, there are tools. And so we've created protocols using those tools. So Total Brain Coaching is really a meta system for coaches to create their own protocols. And on the website, it, if we go to it, you would see there's basically a way for people to share um, their findings. So going, we'll go through each of these principles, 
the idea is that you as coaches would then create your own protocol based on that or use some of the ones that we've created and then use it on whoever you're coaching and share those so that people could start to see, oh, you know, by using this, we get these type of results. So if somebody came to the, a new coach came to the website, they could find some different protocols through Total Brain Coaching that they might want to try with their clients. You might mention the fact that it's a nonprofit open source too. Yes, so it's, <laughs> good point, thanks Dad. Yeah, we're not doing this, we're doing this to create knowledge. Um, we're doing this to help people. If you look on the website itself, there's a counter on the beginning. Our goal is to help a million people. Um, and we're, I think we're about 2,500. We count people who uh, buy the book or take a course or, um, or who we do presentations to. So you'll probably be counted in that counter. Uh, but the idea is basically we, this is, everyone should have this knowledge of how to rewire their own brain so that they can have the life that they want. And we know that coaching is one of the biggest aspects to helping people to do that. So we're trying to make this knowledge available and to get coaches to work together to help people to be able to have those lives that they want. Um, and again, it is a nonprofit. And the whole meta system is what we would call an open source uh, coaching system, meaning people can give their feedback, can make tweaks, can change it, just like with open source um, programming or code. So the first principle uh, is uh, find your, discover your energy state. And once an individual team or organization decides to make a change, they need to understand their own nature and habit and how different external factors affect their inherent strengths and weaknesses. And this is, everybody is different. Everybody is contextually, it's very difficult. You, you apply it in coaching. I've learned lots of methods and you apply that to one person and it works great. And you apply it to somebody else and it doesn't. And why is that? And especially when you're working with teams, you can lose a lot of the effect someone can have a really good effect from the coaching and somebody else might not. So you really need to know who the person is that you're working with and you need to know yourself. Um, Dad, do you want to start on the, you can go into sure. um, energy this state. Is, by way of background, this little quiz we're going to give you is a way of assessing what we call your energy state. And we took all this from Ayurveda um, at the university I'm at, I'm in charge of a program, a master's program in uh, Marshi Ayurveda and integrative medicine. We have uh, many hundred students who are doctors, nurses, who learn this knowledge. And one of the areas of Ayurveda, which is so powerful, is this understanding of each person's um, state. We come with a kind of, we're born, and it's called Ayur genomics. It's a brand new field that's arising, a lot of different scientific papers on it, to show that this method of assessment, which was done thousands of years ago, has a modern scientific basis. So we're going to give you a little quiz here, and I'm going to let Ted, what, you can go through the questions, and yeah, uh, we'll, get, we'll get a scoring for you. And we've, I've gotten feedback. Sometimes I'm a little bit of this V type, so I can go a little quickly. So I'll go through slowly so everybody has a chance to get their scores because that'll make things a little more meaningful. So we're going to first look at the V energy state. And we'd like you to answer these eight questions with a, a number and a higher number, the five being you strongly agree, one being you strongly disagree. So the idea, for example, if... Uh, a light sleeper, difficulty falling asleep. So that, that's not the case for me. I can um, fall asleep pretty quickly. So I'd probably be more like a two on this first question. So that's how I would answer it. Um, irregular appetite though, that can sometimes come up for me. So I'd be more like a four. Um, the next question, the third question is learn quickly but forgets quickly. So you could score yourself on that. So you should have three scores by now, and I'll give, a, I'll give some pauses just so everyone can be in the same space. Um, easily become overstimulated, so you want to score yourself one to five, five being you strongly agree, one being you strongly disagree. 
does not tolerate cold weather very well. A sprinter rather than a marathoner. Your speech is energetic with frequent changes in topic. Anxious and worried under stress. So hopefully now you have eight different numbers and you'll add those up and that'll give you your total V-score. And I'm not able to see the chat. So if I'm going too fast, if you could put something in the chat. Dad, are you able to see the chat? Yeah, For sure. yeah I can tell you. And somebody scored. So um, people are okay. writing their scores in. Okay, great. So I'm going to go now to the V. They're in all different types, uh, many. So it's fun. Yeah, people are kind of seemingly, you're going just the right speed because everybody's Excellent. responding perfectly. Excellent. Okay, so now we're in the P energy state. First question is, easily become overheated. Next question, strong reaction when challenged. Next question, uncomfortable when meals are delayed. Next question, good at physical activity. Next question, strong appetite. Next question, good sleeper, but may not need as much sleep as others. Next question, clear and precise speech. Next question, become irritable and or angry under stress. So again, you'll have eight different scores and you'll add them up and that will give you your P-score. Okay, now I'm gonna to go to the K energy state and there'll again be eight questions. First question, slow eater. Second, fall asleep easily, but wakes up slowly. Third question, steady, stable temperament. Fourth question, doesn't mind waiting to eat. Fifth question, slow to learn, but rarely forgets. Sixth question, good physical strength and stamina. Seventh question, speech may be slow and thoughtful. And eighth question, possessive and stubborn under stress. So again, you'll have eight different scores. You'll add them up and that will give you your K score. Now, hopefully you'll have a V, P and K score. And you'll, everybody has all three of these qualities. So it's not that you're one, just purely one or the other, although some people do have much stronger in one or the other. But the one that's most dominant is usually then what you would say I'm a V type or a P type or a K type. Um, if scores are really close, you could say I'm a VP type or I'm a PK type, like that. So Good. everybody's their scores in, Ted. You did a good job. Perfect. Oh, fantastic. That's excellent. So now do you want to talk about how this uh, works sure. with the... Let's see the next slide. So right. now, why is this knowledge valuable? And it's really one of the main characteristics which distinguishes 
total brain coaching from other um, types of procedures. Of course, we've seen many, many different types of um, procedures, uh, assessment tools, you know, with Myers Briggs, um, Strength Finder, and so forth. But this is a very powerful tool because this knowledge is not just something about personality, it's also about your physiology and the relationship of your mind and body. Ayurveda understood these remarkable principles which enable you to stay in balance. It's a, like an epigenetic thing where by knowing how you can change your diet or something in the environment, you can actually turn on and off genes and reset your physiology. So let's look at the first one, the V energy state. And this V stands for Vata. We used V because it's simpler for a Western person to understand. Um, and in the Ayurveda system, they talk about Prakriti or Vrikriti. This is sort of a combination. And we're trying to make it simple for everyone to understand. So we use the notion of an energy state where you get maximum energy. Now, Individuals with V energy state are known to be creative and energetic when they're in balance. These are often marketing people, uh, very creative artists, um, and everyone has some element within them. And when they're out of balance, they can, can become anxious and easily distracted. So this is very key because the whole notion here is to stay in balance. And for a V energy state person, one of the most powerful ways to stay in balance is having a good routine. And we have some other really remarkable techniques that can help a V-energy person stay in balance. Really amazing. So next slide. P-energy, okay, this is the Pitta type. And this is the V you might think of as more of wind and P you might think of as more as fire. So the P-energy state individual tend um, to have a sharp intellect, goal-oriented, and competitive when in balance, but can be overly angry and aggressive when out of balance. A key component for them, and again, this is one of these deep physiological understandings, is they need to eat on time and also not get overheated. So a classic situation might be for a P-energy person is they're working so hard they skip lunch. And then as the afternoon gets on, they get more and more irritable. And you know, if you can just, so simple, if they just had lunch on time, their whole temperament changes. Next slide. So K energy state, standing for Kapha. K energy state individual is known um, for being steady, supportive, and kind when in balance, but they can become lethargic, stubborn, and even depressed when out of balance. And the key for a K energy um, state person is to get off the couch and be active. They have a tendency to sit, not do much, and they really need to be physically active and to have as many social interactions. Um, they're very easygoing. They are very often the people in a company that kind of are the glue, hold everybody together. They're very good at procedures, making sure everything goes well. So each of these, the sort of, super creative Vata, the super um, dynamic and purposeful P, and the very powerful steady and holding together K. They're all very valuable um, for a family, for a company, um, and we each have a part of this. So you can be a VP, so you can be very dynamic, very creative, but also very purposeful. Um, another scientist and I wrote a whole book called Dharma Parenting, where we talk about the whole notion of what it's like to be one type as a parent and to have a child be another type. And this applies also to you as a coach. If you're a P energy type coach and you have a V energy type client, it's very important that you understand the dynamics. What can happen to that V energy person? What you can, if you're a little overbearing or too purposeful, because most habit change books are written by um, P energy state people for P energy state people. And you really have to take into account that people have another side to them. They have this Vata side and they have this Kapha side. So total brain coaching uses this knowledge in many, many different ways. We use it to help you understand your client, to understand yourself. We help it to understand what it means to get more energy, to change a habit. Um, and the tendencies that people have um, 
you know, Vata person can change very quickly, but then they might adopt a habit, but then suddenly they lose it, go on to another one. So each person is different. And we'll go through those as we go along here. Next slide. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead, Dad. <laughs> okay. So this is fundamental. We talked about this at the beginning already. Harness neuroplasticity and the gut-brain axis. This is our understanding of neurophysiology. The next slide. Um, essentially, we really take the position that it's easier to create a new habit than to change an old one. Old habits are very deep. Addictions are very deep in the brain. Everybody knows they're very hard to change. Even when somebody uh, gets rid of an addiction, it's still kind of there in the background. They need all kinds of support. So it's much easier to create a new habit. And as um, Ted said earlier, habits are like neural circuits and to establish a new habit involves a creation of new wiring in the brain. So that's very important. It takes energy to change pathways in the brain to create a new pathway. So that's why we're so focused on your energy and boosting your energy. And one thing we found is that there are what we call super habits. And these are things which, um, next slide, which help you um, change other habits. So I've studied for most of my life uh, meditation, um, particularly transcendental meditation. I've, uh, we At the university I'm at, we had $25 million worth of grants to do studies on cardiovascular disease. And what we find is that people that learn to meditate, and this is a very easy technique to learn, this particular one. Um, once they learn that, it's much easier for them to make other changes, whether it's to stop smoking, to exercise more regularly, and so forth. So these are, different people have different super habits. Some people do yoga, some people take a walk on the beach. One simple keystone habit, as um, Charles Duhigg and The Power of Habits talks about, can help you change all kinds of other habits. And we really focus on um, Ayurveda because it's got a beautiful set of habits that understands who you are. And we also focus on meditation, particularly transcendental meditation. These two are very important in our whole program. Um, you could do some other kind of meditation. It's just that we happen to find this one meditation is, from my research anyway, is very easy and very good results. But the principles are there. Assess the individual, find out who they are, who you are, find a super habit that works. Right, and, and the super habit, especially with meditation, this idea of transcending the ability for the mind to reset. When, you know, one of the things which is sort of the enemy against learning a new habit or learning anything is again, as dad had talked about earlier, in this stress, uh, state because you're in fight or flight and you're all about like surviving and not about learning. So uh, something, a super habit that can reset the mind and, and just sort of let the, the mind come to rest and, and clear away the other kind of neural pathways. Those we've seen uh, a lot of success in the field with people who have that. Gut brain axis, dad. So this is, you know, one of the great new discoveries in our world today that we have this gut brain axis, which is the nervous system, the endocrine system, the immune system, the enteric nervous system, that is the nervous system around the gut, and the enteric endocrine system, that is the um, endocrine glands that are in the gut. And most importantly, the gut bacteria, what we call the microbiome. This microbiome turns out to be hugely important in our lives and in our health. Almost every disease has been traced to some problem either in the microbiome or in leaky gut, some gut problem. Um, so an understanding of the gut-brain axis can be a huge benefit to helping people gain more energy so they can change habits. Uh, next slide. Oh, good. So we moved on there. Okay, so we can talk more about um, gut crisis and the gut brain. I, I, anytime you have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer it. It's a huge, huge area. And the great thing is, it's something that all the traditional systems of medicine understood, like Ayurveda. They knew 
that that was the essence of disease was some disorder in the gut. And modern science is just figuring this out right now. Okay, Ted, I'll let you go on here. Sure, and just to kind of add on that, so these first two principles that we talked about, discover your energy state, and then the neuroplasticity and gut-brain axis, this helped me as a coach tremendously because um, I, when working with clients or when working with teams or even organizations, um, once you kind of know the energy state of the individuals, the teams, the organization is obviously a, a mixture of all of that, but um, then you kind of know who you're working with. And also the whole neuroplasticity and gut-brain axis, if people are not in good shape, if, they, if they've got a lot going on in their lives, you understand that those people, it, they, it may take them longer to kind of learn the things or to, to make the progress that they want to make. That as your coaches, they want to do things, but if they're not in balance, if their gut brain is not in balance, if, they're, if they don't have the energy to create these neural pathways, um, it'll be harder for them. And it's good to give them that awareness, like, oh, we have to get some level of balance in the physiology so you can make the progress. Um, and that's been, that was a huge kind of help for me in terms of coaching people. Um, the next principle is use the power of attention. And the easiest way to create a new habit is to use the power of attention to do, to initiate small doable steps. So this is uh, something that is in actually many other books. There's books out there called Atomic Habits, um, Tiny Habits. We'll talk a little bit about those. But the idea is not to take off something too big to break it down into smaller and smaller um, pieces. And is there any more you wanted to add on that, Dad? No, no, that's fine. I think, you know, there's a principle that uh, what you put your attention on grows stronger. And so we use that principle. Um, and, you know, I think you said everything. That's fine. Okay, great. Somehow the slide's gotten off a little bit. Um, so hmm. the fourth, fourth principle is finding your inner rhythm. Each integral team or organization has their own inner rhythm. Being in tune with their rhythm is extremely important. And do you want to talk more about that one, Dad? Um, you know, this one is a very interesting one. Uh, we could go into it more, but it really focuses on different areas of your life. You know, Vata person, is a very quick inner rhythm, um, but sometimes, you know, it, it can get unsteady. The Pitta person is a kind of medium rhythm, but it's very focused on a purpose. And the Kapha has a much slower rhythm, but it's much more thorough in what it does. And so this understanding of each person's rhythm, and you know, you can be a combination, um, that helps you understand how quickly somebody might change a habit. Because for a Kapha person, it might take a lot longer to change a habit than for a P energy person or Pitta person. So, um, and we also have uh, some very good pieces of advice for areas like diet, sleep, exercise, um, stress, um, to, routine, these different areas to help you boost your energy because you need to have that energy to change a habit. And that's all some, something we can go into more later on. Good, we have the fifth principle, um, use the feedback matrix for maximum coaching results. Use the force multiplier matrix, which involves four techniques. Um, so when it comes to uh, changing your habit, so creating a new habit, reinforcement's really the name of the game. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So you have to keep getting those patterns in the brain to keep firing together, so they wire together. And we use four different coaching techniques. Um, we have people do self-coaching. So that's like journal or using apps. Um, there's so much incredible electronic devices out there that can help people, especially in the health areas. Um, we also, of course, strongly recommend personal coaching. So getting a coach is absolutely one of the best ways for you to um, be able to rewire your brain in the way you want or to achieve the things that you want to. Coaches obviously allow you to see perspectives that you can't see. You might be locked in your mind on certain things and think this is the only way to do things. 
Of course, if I'm doing any kind of executive coaching, that's normally <laughs> the question I'm asking is yes and, you know, what's, what's another possibility? You know, looking at it, it, you have a wall in front of you. What does that wall feel like? You know, who is that wall? And starting to get people to look at the situation from different things. So it's allowing you to get out of the own um, programming of your own brain when you have a personal coach or a partner there to ask you some deep questions and be able to listen at a very deep level. Also, group coaching is very powerful. You know, if you want to, you know, as simple as losing weight, you know, join a running club. You know, this is getting that group um, together can reinforce the patterns in your brain that you want. Or in coaching, we have cohorts. You know, it's, it's super important for a coach to get coached because that's what reinforces those patterns in their brain. And, and absolutely one of the most powerful coaching techniques is environmental coaching. Um, that's the uh, triggers and uh, Marshall Goldsmith has talked about that. But, you know, again, let's go back to the way someone wants to, you know, lose some weight. Um, they just remove the snacks from the house. You know, it's that kind of thing where if you can do things in the environment and the coaching that I do, uh, agile coaching, one of the biggest things that happened was just getting the programmers to sit next to each other so they could actually communicate because programmers have a tendency not to communicate very well. So by putting them, co-locating them together, suddenly communication improved and the product that was being produced is able to be produced faster and at higher quality. So we use all of these four different types of techniques in total brain coaching to reinforce the new pathways that you're trying to build. Uh, we also use continuous improvement and integration. This is also um, each step of progress should be measured and evaluated. Rapid feedback helps facilitate improvement and integration. And we actually just, we have a, a tool called the vector framework, which I use for sort of individuals um, and for teams right now. And the idea is that you basically, as a person, you wanna to drive towards an outcome, not an output. So you wanna to drive towards, I wanna lose this weight, if it's something as simple as that, I wanna overcome this, I wanna be able to talk to my boss in a better way. As a team, I wanna be able to produce more. So it's good to get these big vectors figured out what the real outcomes are, and then all the little experiments that you try um, become little vectors, which work into that bigger vector. And so that gives kind of a nice visual tool for people to use to kind of figure out how they're gonna make progress. Um, that's part of the continuous improvement and integration. And finally, we have celebration. This is one that sadly many people uh, don't realize that in, in terms of creating habits, by celebrating your success is absolutely one of the best ways to reinforce and to build habits. Um, and if there was more celebration that, especially around, you know, wins, that's great. If you see any kind of high performing sports team, uh, I, I play volleyball, so that's a big, you know, I, I do that a lot and I enjoy that sport a lot. And whenever the team I'm on, we do something really good, we're all high-fiving. And it's just reinforcing that kind of winning habit. Whatever we did in that last couple seconds, um, we want to reinforce that because that seemed to work. Uh, but just like that, when we're coaching people, we want to have some type of celebration for the small wins and the big wins. You want to talk about the progress principle, Dad? Sure. This is a study done at Harvard where they found that fear and pressure were not good motivators for higher performance and that happiness and inner positive emotions were. And this just kind of um, showed the value of positive reinforcement to enhance motivation. Uh, this can be applied to many areas of life and especially habit change. Um, this is, you know, one of these things that's kind of the difference between sort of the old style of management and new style of management. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. It's no new news to you, but um, believe it or not in the world, it is big news out there that you can actually um, show that, um, you know, fear and stress are not really good at motivating people that um, happiness and inner positive emotions are better. 
And this is kind of built into your whole system. There's something called the dopamine feedback loop. It's one of the things that causes us to have addictions. Um, we release a particular chemical in anticipation of some um, enjoyment, and that is dopamine. And this dopamine um, builds up. Um, the body tries to protect itself by uh, stopping too much of this, and so it lowers the number of receptors, and so you have to have more and more dopamine. And you pretty much uh, get into problems with this with addictions. Now, we've made the notion, hey, it's hard to get rid of old habits. It's much easier to create new ones, and especially if they're positive ones like meditation or many of the principles we'll see in Ayurveda, which are really a whole series of wonderful good habits. And it's that the notion is kind of a use it or lose it principle. If you're focusing on something more positive, um, and that has become your main focus, then these older pathways, they seem to just kind of, they don't completely get eliminated, but they have less power in you. And so if you can use the dopamine to reinforce the new positive habits and not reinforce the old negative ones, that's a very powerful way of doing it. And it all comes into this notion of kind of um, using um, happiness and inner positive emotions. So next slide. Yeah, so, so these seven principles are somewhat, uh, they can be abstract. So we'd like to have a sort of an example of one protocol that we've created that we use, that we've had success with. Um, so we use different tools from those principles. So we do use the VPK tool from um, Discover Your Energy State. And so the person who did this, this was their scores. So you can see they're actually pretty balanced. They have all three, a little bit more of the P type. And this gave us some insights. Their goal was to lose uh, 10 to 15 pounds. That was their goal. So we created what we call a habit map, which is, okay, here's the, the thing, the outcome we want. And then here are some of the, we asked the person, what have you tried? We kind of went through a coaching process of figuring out what some of the possibilities that they thought they could do. Um, I'll read out a few of them just because you won't be able to read my writing on the board. Drink more water, exercise more, skip meals, eat less, stop snacking, um, count calories. <clears throat> so they were a P-type. They needed to eat regularly. So that was good. Um, and what we came to in our coaching session was they wanted to try stop snacking. Um, so we use, we, we kind of broke that down into smaller kind of two steps. One, we said, okay, well, how do we get more out of each meal that we're eating? Because you, you notice they also had a high B type um, or, and so they, I, the question came up, you know, how long does it take you to eat? And it turns out they ate very quickly. So one of the, the uh, techniques that we used was they would put their fork down every time they took a bite and they put their full power of attention. This is kind of with the power of attention, the attention principle, full attention on the food that they were eating, no distractions, and take a couple minutes afterwards to relax after the meal. So that was one thing, experiment. The other one was when they felt like snacking, um, we'd have them sip on some hot water or cool water, depending. They were a little bit of a P-type, so it wasn't too hot was a kind of a cooler water. So those were the two experiments that we did. And um, in terms of the rhythms uh, principle, we basically, uh, we had them also try to get more neuroplasticity. So we, uh, we talked about what they could do to have a better sleep, more meditation, um, more blueberries. This was something that they liked and it's, it's had some effect on neuroplasticity. So we did that. And also reading a book at night rather than being on their electronic devices. So we were um, knowing the information that we did from the energy state and from neuroplasticity and gut brain axis, we were trying to get them more energy so they could build a, this habit of um, not snacking or not getting rid of that habit by sipping water um, instead of snacking and also putting more attention when they were eating. And the, the kind of, um, four different reinforcement, the matrix principle. Um, they were journaling, 
They had a coach that they met with every week. Uh, their wife also was in on it, so they were a partner. Uh, their family kind of would report what was going on every week to their family to get some group feedback and uh, positivity. And the environmental coaching step was just to remove snack food. So it was in, they, they put the snack food uh, in a place where this person couldn't get it. And kind of our steps, we, we measured every day what their weight was. And the kind of celebration was if they reached a certain goal, um, then they got to go on a weekend retreat with their wife. So that was, um, this is to give you an example of one such thing. We've also done it with teams. I've done it with teams where they were trying to stop the habit of always taking on new work um, and kind of showing people their board of work and saying, if you're going to give me this new thing, then I have to push out this thing and kind of move. So we went through this with a team also. Um, and the team was also a P-type, very strongly a P-type. So it was good for them. We could figure out, hey, you got to make sure you take your meals on time. You got to make sure that when people come, I know you want to do these things. But we had this little habit that we would have them is show them this board, try to figure out where it is, or to we were getting them on a, a new system where there was somebody else that they would refer to and say, oh, please talk to that person instead of just taking the work and putting it on. So those are some examples of how we've used total brain coaching um, out in the field. Probably it's been this one protocol that we're showing right now has probably been used 30, 40 times um, and each time with good success sometimes. Um, and we have some of those things on our website. So I think we're kind of at, is it the end of it, Dad? Well, that's the end. Yeah, well, now we like to take questions and that's answers just, if we can. Yeah, that'd this, be great. Yeah. I'm going to turn off my screen and I'm going to, so I can see everybody and see the chat. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of chat. Yeah, there's a lot of questions in here. Um, keep asking them, what was the type of meditation Keith mentioned, please? So I, um, in most of my research, uh, I did it at UCLA and at Harvard University, was on transcendental meditation taught by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Um, and as I said, there's at our university, which is called Maharishi International University. Um, it's miu.edu. I'll write it in here. That's the website. So you can see a lot. Uh, maybe you can write it in, Ted. Um, yeah, that has all kinds of different courses. As I said, master's degree online in Ayurveda, integrative medicine. It's got really every single department you can think of. And um, it's uh, uh, an area, a university we are talking with Magda about trying to work out some arrangement with Coach Acharya, which would probably be good for everyone since we do have um, financial aid here. Um, and we talked to Ram about it. So it's one of those, you know, we're trying to create more of a coaching atmosphere here at the university. Um, we have a lot of graduates of the university who are top executive coaches. So we'd like to set up a network and uh, everyone at the university practices transcendental meditation. Um, and when it's not COVID, we do it in a group. It's a very sweet atmosphere. Um, and it's, uh, for those of you who are from India, and I see many are, um, we spent a lot of time in India, a lot of time talking to some of the really great and wise people there. We really feel India had some amazing knowledge. And um, being with Marji and meeting all the different uh, people in India made us realize really uh, what huge knowledge is there and uh, how important it is to get that knowledge out. So um, that's something um, that's part of uh, my agenda, um, separate from doing total brain coaching with Ted. Um, and I'm a trustee at the university and I'm the founding president of the university. And I'm also head of the physiology and health department. 
So um, this is an area I'm doing, I still do research, but I do it now instead of just doing transcendental meditation, I'm a little more focused on um, Ayurveda. And I just did a paper I published in a medical journal on the microbiome as it's seen from the perspective of modern medicine and Ayurveda. I really would like to integrate modern medicine with Ayurveda. That's a very strong goal I have. And I really see that um, coaching is a super powerful area to do that. It's, it's, there's so many things you can do to help your clients that are very, very simple, but are based on this huge knowledge of Ayurveda and can have a big impact on creating more energy and more clarity in your client. Good. And so just so I know about questions, how much time are we ending at 12 our time or is there? We have a half an hour, Ted, so we're okay. No. Okay, good, good. So good. So there's uh, some more questions on especially, um, <clears throat> so people have tried, they, they've made the changes in their habits, but then it hasn't stuck. So what do you do? How do we sustain a habit? I've seen, especially myself, that once I meet my goal, I tend to lose focus, go back to the old habit. So if you're a V type, and I have this with many clients, but if you're a V type, um, it means that you need some creativity. It's very difficult for V types to just do the same thing all the time. So, so basically you have to make new experiments to keep moving towards that big vector that you wanna to go to. If, on the simple example of losing weight, you may be able to do something with some diet or this, this snack, you know, not snacking thing. But after a couple of bit, you'll be like, oh, I'm bored of this. <laughs> you know, this is how it works. And so you have to then come at it from another angle. So that's why it's so important to know this V, P, and K types, because the V types need creativity. The P types, they can just do this routine thing day in, day out. The K type, it may take, you know, some more energy to get them over that first hump. But then once they get into it, they can just start going on it. Do you have more to add, Dad, on that? Or? Well, that's good. There's an interesting question here. Uh, a person who's a K-type, but they have a similar um, experience. And um, you'd have to know your whole range because you say you're a K-type predominantly, which probably allows you to at least keep a habit going pretty good. But if you have some V in there, I'm assuming there's probably some V in there, then, uh, you know, Vata, that, you know, depends. That's the one that gets out of balance the easiest. And that's very possible then that it's upsetting the K, which is more sustaining, which would normally allow you to keep a habit going for a long period of time. But if that kind of Vata energy is out of balance, and it's the one that usually first goes out of balance, usually because of tiredness, stress, too much stimulation, um, Vodas have a hard time going to bed at night because usually that's a, a time when, you know, if you're on the computer or you're doing stuff, it overexcites. So um, even if you're a K type, your Vada could go out of balance and that could cause you then suddenly to be less interested in sustaining your habit. Because by normal, uh, you know, experience, the Ks are the ones that actually are the best able to sustain a habit. Yeah, there's a good quiz for VPK also on totalbraincoaching.com. In the middle of that first page, there's an electronic quiz that we actually spent a lot of time building. So people can take that and that'll also give you a good sense of, of VPK. Uh, there's yeah, a and, Oh, you got one. Okay, good. And as I, you know, um, there, as I said before, it's based on Ayurveda and now there's this whole new field called Ayur genomics, which is the combination of Ayurveda and genetics. So they're finding that the Vada, Pitta, and Kapha actually have a genetic basis. So yeah, yes, thanks. Somebody put V is for Vada, P is for Pitta, K is for Kapha. And so now they're finding out that there is this um, physiological basis to this ancient knowledge. And so you're born with a certain set of genes that'll determine how your brain works. I mean, you could see this with kids. If you're a parent, literally from day one, certain kids will eat very quickly, 
certain kids, kids will eat very slowly. And you think, wow, how can they be so different? They're brought up in the same environment. But they do have these inherent tendencies that are there. Now, your environment has a huge impact though. So they're not permanent. It's not like you're fixed into one framework. Um, the environment will change it. And you have to realize no one is better than the other. From the perspective of this tradition, each one can reach enlightenment. Each one can reach its full potential. Each one has a huge contribution to give to the world. So there's no one better than the other. And essentially, the changing of it is like epigenetics. We're born with a certain genetic code, but our environment will cause one gene to be expressed, another to be shut down. So even though you may have identical twins that have exactly the same set of genes, their environment, if they're brought up in different environments, they have different food preferences, they have all kinds of different things. So we know that many things in our environment change our genes. Food, there's a whole field, nutra genomics. What you eat not only changes your microbiome, which has a huge influence on whether you're happy, sad, or whatever, but what you eat also changes genetic expression in your body. So diet is extremely important. In the you know, old days, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, said all disease begins in the gut. No doctor today has even the remotest understanding of what that means. Suddenly now, with the understanding of the microbiome, people reading about Ayurveda, Chinese traditional medicine, now they're getting it. They're like, oh my gosh, this is really important. And I understand you eat this food, it could change the different bacteria. It could be more of this, less of that. They could produce these chemicals. They get in the body, they go up to the brain, they influence whether I'm happy or sad. It's like all of a sudden we're rediscovering what people knew for many thousands of years, but Western medicine just went off in a completely different direction and now integrating. So these are wonderful uh, bits of knowledge. And, you know, Ayurveda treatments, there are many herbs they use, just like Chinese traditional medicine. Um, they use food, they use uh, lifestyle changes, meditation is a crucial part of Ayurveda. And they have a whole set of herbs. And they have purification treatments. So there, you can go into this in a very simple way and learn some very simple uh, tricks that can help people. And, you know, like a pitta person, if you get them to eat on time, you solve half their problems because they're the ones that lose their temper, that get angry. Um, you know, my family makes sure I eat on time. It makes all the difference. Um, Vata person, very simple. If you just, they have a nice daily routine, which they don't like, but they follow a daily routine and they just sip hot water throughout the day. Amazing. All of a sudden they're going from doing a million different things to being very well balanced. That creativity now has, is a better channel for it to flow through. And a kapha person, again, get them off the couch, get them outside, get them doing activity find creative things. Um, you have a kapha child, they're always the slowest at everything. They take longer to go to school, take longer to eat, and they love to sit on the couch and play computer games. You gotta get involved. You gotta get them out there. More sports activities, more creative activities, more social activities, and suddenly they're so kind, they're so supportive, they just add to everybody's life. So each one of these has their pitfalls and each one has their advantages. And you, when you understand how to keep a person in balance, you can help them change their habits so much easier. I mean, when you're upset, when you don't have energy, when you're not sleeping, how can you even think about changing a habit? It's impossible. If you're having gut problems, it just overwhelms you. How are you gonna change anything? So you gotta get to the basics first. And once you get to the basics, you get more energy, um, you get more clarity. I mean, we're giving this out in little bits here. In our books, it's given out completely. So these books are, you can get them all on Amazon. There's an ebook version. They're not very expensive. Um, and they go into much more detail. Um, I've written books on whole diets, the rest and repair diet, which really talks about how to reboot your gut and how to 
um, Reboot Your Microbiome. So written lots of books on transcendental meditation that you can learn from. So there's lots of websites, our website, um, the web, MIU website, huge amount of information out there. Right now, MIU is offering a free course in an introduction to Ayurveda. If you go to uh, MIU online courses, um, there's an eight lesson course that I gave with a doctor from Germany that goes really deeply into Ayurveda, really covers it completely. They have 20,000 people taking free yoga classes. So everybody's doing yoga for somebody's in Indonesia, somebody someplace else. And twice a week they do live classes and they have all kinds of tapes. So there's a lot of free knowledge that's out there right now um, that's available to you. Good. There's another question. Do patterns of the new habits change patterns of the old habits or do they overpower the old habits? I mean, it's use it or lose it. That's the simplest way of looking at it. Um, you know, your brain is very practical. When you're a teenager, when you're young, you have more connections than you're ever going to have. And uh, about age five to 10 or something, there's a huge number of connections in the brain, more than you need. And then, you know, at some point, eight, nine, 10 or whatever, you start to do something called neural pruning. And neural pruning is just like you're pruning a garden. You cut out branches that are not being used. And the brain does this. So you're already at a very young age using this principle. If I'm not doing something right now, I don't need it. I can just prune it out, more space for everything else. So this is a very natural kind of phenomenon. So if you put all your attention on a new habit, the old one, in some cases, those connections will just wither away. If they're very, very deep, they may not go completely away, but they'll be far less predominant in your consciousness. How young can children start meditating? A four uh, years old, uh, Ted learned when he was four years old. Um, there's a special technique for children. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very simple. They do it when they're walking. Um, it's very, they don't really learn to do a sitting technique until they're 10 years old. So this is, was carefully thought out by people thousands of years ago, how best to do this and what to do. Um, you know, so we're borrowing from a really beautiful tradition, the Vedic tradition of India is so rich, so powerful, and so badly misunderstood. Um, and somebody brought up the term hangry. That's exactly what it is. That's what happens to a pitta person. And I bet someday they'll figure this out. I think they'll find out pitta person has certain genes, and when they're not fed on time, the gut will probably produce certain chemicals, which will go to the amygdala in the brain, and set it off. So, you know, just a matter of that, those pathways being unfolded, but uh, Ayurveda knew about it a long, long ago. Good. Any more sort of burning questions? I've, I've scanned through. Um, when does this session, oh, when did this session start? Oh, about an hour and 10 minutes ago. And it'll so, be uh, on tape, according to Magda, so you can um, re-see the whole thing. Yes, we're recording, so it'll be, uh, it'll be available to watch afterwards. And we're also continuing the conversation on LinkedIn, so I'll post that into, uh, into the chat as well. Yes, it does have, a, somebody asked, does the VPK have a resemblance to the five, five body types in China? Yes, very much so. You have to realize that China and India long ago communicated. They had a huge amount of knowledge that went back and forth. I mean, Buddha started in India. Buddha then went to China, or at least his disciples did. And suddenly there was this huge flow of knowledge. I've been to China many times with Ayurveda doctors. One doctor who was one of the greatest um, Ayurveda doctors I've ever seen, he could diagnose the pulse of anyone. And, and Ayurveda has a beautiful system of pulse diagnosis, like the Chinese, but a little different. And he was, I took him to the NIH in Washington, 
And he told one of these directors there, oh yeah, you just passed a kidney stone. The guy was so blown away. He had, how did you know that? What, what, how could you possibly know that? And so the, you know, the people everywhere loved this because it was such a perfect demonstration. This was Dr. Triguna, who's no longer with us, but he was the head of many of the organizations in India. And he um, said about the program that we teach at our university now for pulse diagnosis. So there is a great similarity between these two, but they have different languages. So it's quite a lot of work to translate one into the other. Um, each tradition has created its own vocabulary. So you have to study a lot to be able to bridge these two, but we do have people that do that very well. Uh, let's see, somebody from Kerala, wonderful part of India, beautiful, lovely, special, oh my gosh, one of the nicest places in the world. And we focus on energy path and holistic wellness intertwined with yoga and meditation. Yes, even the martial arts are there. Uh, yeah, and Kerala is spectacular. Wonderful, wonderful place. Been there a number of times. Been to Kanyakumari, Rameshwaram. Um, I love those places. Uh, so many wonderful qualities, so many great places and what a beautiful tradition. What's your opinion of neuro-linguistic programming and the techniques for habit build? I don't know that much about it. Ted, you might be able to answer it better than I can. Um, again, they use repetition. They, so again, reinforcement is the name of the game. Like this simple principle of neuro, neurons that fire together, wire together. So I know that they use that. I'm not trained in that. So I don't have all the knowledge of that. Um, it's interesting, their book called, uh, is it called Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg? Just recently came out. He's kind of a lead scientist in um, Stanford. And we read through the book. Our, our book came out like at the beginning of this year. His book just came out like about six of them. He's studied like 40,000 people. <laughs> I mean, he's had huge amount of, of things. And a lot of the principles that he was talking about were things that we had also, you know, obviously we had been reading all the same things and it was very much that kind of gave us a lot of um, a, a good feeling because he had done a ton of research, but it is a great book. If you get a chance to read that one also, he's done a tremendous work. Um, so zooming back to neuro-linguistic programming, I'm not, um, you know, I, I, I know that some of the things cross over, but uh, I don't know uh, enough about it to really make a, a super educated saying. Which group can get Given the, the pandemic, which group yeah. can get the most benefit from or be more receptive to total brain coaching? Well, I mean, you know, the pandemic has made a lot of people um, concern more about their health. I mean, ultimately in this world, people need to take more responsibility for their health. You know, just go to, to a doctor and getting a pill is nice, but it's not really what's even recommended. You need to have to, you know, you need to take charge of your life. And I think in some ways the COVID has made people go more inward, be more concerned about their health. I know our numbers of people taking our Ayurveda courses has gone up dramatically. So my only guess is that people are more concerned about how to prevent disease, because that's the key. Prevention is everything. And so if you can have good lifestyle habits, that will improve your immune system. Um, and you know every doctor says that you need sleep, you need proper diet, you need certain vitamins, you need um, exercise, meditation. Uh, these are all fundamental to keeping a strong physiology. A strong physiology uh, gives you a strong immune system. We don't know why some people get this disease, why others don't. Um, it's very confusing. It's amazing. But long ago, I saw a paper where, this was maybe 10 years ago, where they injected people with a different kind of virus. And they looked to see how people reacted to it. And they did a whole analysis of their genes, which genes were turned on, which were turned off. And it was interesting, about two thirds of the people got a normal response. They got, you know, sniffles, they got all the cold syndromes, inflammation, so forth. 
And it took them the normal amount of time. And you could see the genes turned on, all the inflammatory genes being turned on just at the right moments as you would expect in a colder virus. But an, a third of the group literally had nothing. They didn't get the symptoms. They might've gotten a little tired. Um, they didn't have these inflammatory genes turned on. Um, it was like they were a different group entirely. Now, I wish I could have done a Vedic analysis on them with Ayurveda, because my guess is they're probably Pitta people who are already got their immune system on high. And, you know, a Pitta person generally uh, can go anywhere and not get sick. So that's, you know, depends. You know, it's, it depends on your mixture. It depends on many, many things. But so I think Ayurveda understood this, that certain people would be less susceptible to getting a virus or cold infection, but then they may have a problem later in their life with inflammation. They may need to turn it down at some point. So we're all kind of blessed with some mixture of good and bad. And COVID is just one new challenge to everyone's lives. Um, but I think the basics are all there. Uh, people are less stressed. If they're uh, more inward, they take more responsibility for their health. They have a better chance of in su supporting their immune system, which is essentially what you have to do. And COVID is really an inward step for so many people. Obviously, it's forced inward step. But I think that bodes well for the coaching um, profession. I think people are looking, just as my dad was saying, they're looking more inward they're deciding they want to make changes in their life and they're looking for help to make those changes. As we've talked about, it's not always easy to make these changes because um, when we do the habit maps and habit plans, we also look at you know, what people's habits are that are preventing them. So a simple example is somebody wanted to stop drinking coffee, you know, which I, I wasn't that person, but that somebody did want to do that. And we had to figure out why they were drinking coffee and they said, well, because that's what wakes me up in the morning. So they were, they had some K in them. They were more kind of productive. So this coffee was kind of, and that can be okay sometimes, but what else can you do that could wake you up in the morning? Well, I could do an exercise thing. I don't want to, but I could. So we kind of did this thing together where we got them on this kind of exercise routine in the morning. So they would wake up. So not only were they not drinking coffee anymore, but they were also exercising regularly, which was helping their day tremendously. So that's how you can kind of start to see when you look at the different habits that people have, how you can leverage certain things to build kind of better habit plans for people. So somebody's asking if this was um, genetic or is it more contextual? And it's both. The VPK right. is based on, you know, what I've seen in the research, based on kind of what you're born with, um, and it's also based on how what your how nature affects you. So, just like everything in our genetic makeup, we have a certain genetic makeup, but our environment changes which genes gets expressed or don't. Um, somebody asked, "What are your thoughts on the vagus nerve neck compression and how it relates to mind body gut connection?" I'm not an MD. I'm a, a researcher, so it's not something I could say exactly what to do and i wouldn't want to give medical advice anyway on a you know something like this i would say you know the vagus nerve is hugely important it's key to um how the gut and the brain communicate everyone knows that now and it's bi-directional so if you have you know something that's hurting the vagus nerve obviously that's a very important thing to get corrected whatever approach you take because um, that nerve, it's not the only way the gut and brain communicate. They communicate chemically, but it's one of the main ways of this gut-brain connection. Good. I think we've gone We have a couple more minutes for questions. Um, if anyone wants to, uh, to speak up, speak now. And uh, I have also, I'll repost it, but I put a link on the chat so that we can continue the conversation on LinkedIn. I'll include a lot of the links that we've had here, which have been fantastic. And uh, this has been amazing. I'm, I'm so excited. I've, I've been here all the way through, but I'm actually so excited to, uh, 
go back and watch this recording and and uh and take some notes as well for myself so we're also doing a course at our university at the continuing education division right now on total brain coaching and we're bringing in a lot of really good guest speakers to speak to so it's a really you know coaching is now just emerging i know you guys have been doing it for a long time and i congratulate you on it um, and my son got me into it. He's a great coach. Um, and so now we want to, at the university, get into it in a more formal way and connect everyone up. So I think you'll see more and more programs being offered here. Um, can Tracy, can we end early if we want to? I mean, it seems like everybody's happy and content. Uh, especially after the session, it's been amazing. Um, absolutely. So uh, I would say, uh, I think everyone's questions have been answered. I'm posting the LinkedIn uh, group in the chat so that we can continue and I'll make sure to include any, I'll connect with, with you uh, as well, just to see if there's any specific links that I should include. Um, thank you so much. This has been, this has been wonderful and it's been nice to, uh, Nice to be here, nice chatting with you for a few minutes before the session as well. And thanks for everyone that joined. Um, as you're aware, we have, uh, we have three sessions going per day. So please look at the Awake, Aware, Arise website for all of the relevant times. And um, thanks for being here, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank, um, you. thank you, Tracy, very much for hosting us. Yeah, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. It's a wonderful group, wonderful questions. And really, we want to change the world all together. This is, this is a group coming out of COVID that can make a huge difference. So we're deeply happy to be connected to you. And I'm deeply happy to be able to present with my father, who I adore. <laughs> I'm deeply happy to present with my son, too. Thank you, guys. Thank awesome. you very much.